everyone. It's Friday afternoon, and you know what that means. It means Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And here we are. I have a cast of thousands today. So we have Peter Rosig from the Hawaiian Electric Company. He's got some great news. I've got Scott Higgins, who works with me at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. He's got some excellent news. And of course, we have Jay Fidel, who's my overseer for today. And he's doing some QA on me, and he's He's going to help me uh, handle uh, our guest today. Okay, so and, and I have regards, I got regards for you, Mitch, from Sharon Moriwaki. I spoke to her a little while ago, and she sends regards. Remember that she is the progenitor of this program. She is overarching on all of us. Right. So first of all, uh, we're going to uh, talk to Peter. And Peter's got some great news about some uh, new... Um, you know, the, the latest state of play for the renewable portfolio standards for Hawaiian Electric. And uh, Peter, why don't you tell us your good news? Well, uh, the good news is that we have sent to the Public Utilities Commission for review eight new contracts for uh, new renewable energy and storage facilities. Uh, the result of our the second phase of our, uh, of our RFP. Uh, in total, if all of these projects come uh, to fruition, we will, it will be the largest single uh, procurement of renewable energy in the Hawaiian Islands, about 300 megawatts of uh, solar capacity, about 2000 megawatt hours of storage capacity. Uh, six of these projects are on Oahu, two of them are on uh, Maui. We have some other projects that are still under negotiation. So the total of this tranche may increase, but we're still pretty uh, pretty proud of this. And we're um, optimistic that the commission will approve it. If uh, if all of them, as I say, come to fruition, it'll increase our RPS, our renewable portfolio standard by about nine percentage points. So we think we'll be at 30% by the end of this year. And within about two and a half, three years, when these other projects come online, we will be at uh, 39 or so percent, uh, assuming all goes well. And so, so this is a substantial increase. This, this is 9% nine, 9 increase in renewables, isn't that right? Nine percentage points, 30 to 39, right. And you know, we were just talking earlier, when you think about the fact that a little over 10 years ago, we were at 8%, 9%. Uh, we have come in about 10 years to, to about 30%, roughly tripling. We'll go up for another third uh, within about a year and a half, two years when these projects come online. So, uh, you know, this is really pretty dramatic and it's pretty exciting for us. So uh, there's a couple of good things about it. I mean, one is that AES is coming off uh, right. its coal arrangement and you're going to replace all that coal out there at Campbell uh, with renewables. That's a good step, isn't it? It is. It is. Obviously, uh, the coal is a uh, is a big cause of, of uh, emissions and, and climate change. We're glad the, the contract is coming to an end and we're glad not to renew that contract. Over on Maui, the Kahului power plant's been around a long time, 38 megawatts or so of oil fire generation. Uh, it's done its service and now it's time to retire it. So these projects will allow that to happen without any uh, deterioration of service, without uh, because we'll have generation, but we'll also have storage. So we have, uh, we'll have kind of two, two sorts of storage. One is what we call load shifting, which means you accumulate power during the day when the sun is shining and you're able to use it from five to nine at night when most people are using electricity. And we also have what we call fast frequency or contingencies. Uh, and that means that if there's a problem on the system, you have about a half an hour of, of uh, battery storage that can be instantly put into the system. And that gives our system operators half an hour, to figure out the problem and figure out how to solve it without deteriorating service. So that's, that sounds like a, a replacement of the technology in the peaking plant at Kapolei, uh, sort of a, a battery solution to uh, peaking. Exactly, exactly right. So uh, it allows us to, uh, you know, maintain the system and have the assurance that we can, instead of just starting up a peaking unit, which is uh, usually diesel and very, uh, you know, expensive and, and very much a, uh, a, a generator of emissions, uh, we can do it uh, using the storage that we have available on the system. There'll be some of that on Maui and some of that here. 
So, Peter, what are, what's the mix on, on these various uh, new contracts? Is it, is it all solar? Is it a combination of renewables? What is it? It's all solar. Uh, one of the systems that we have allowed for is a standalone storage system here on Oahu. And then uh, there are two others that are not part of this eight I've been talking about that Hawaiian Electric is going to build. And those are both standalone storage as well. So, uh, but eight of the nine projects that we are, uh, are some sort of seven of the eight projects we're sending to the commission, we have sent to the commission this week um, are solar, uh, various sizes, but pretty large and pretty good prices too. Uh, not quite what they were at the first uh, level, but very good. They're going to enable us to reduce the bills on Maui, on, on Oahu, not a huge amount, but by about a dollar a month. Uh, so what's the range of cost per megawatt hour? Uh, you know, they, it goes from about 11 to about, about 10 to 12, I guess, is probably... Oh. Uh, that's a great program. improvement from that's a terrific uh, improvement yeah as i you know before the pandemic we were paying about 15 cents a kilowatt hour for oil fire generation it's come down now because the demand for oil worldwide has come down and so prices have come down a small silver line to this this ugly pandemic but uh the still the the prices uh are very good compared to what we would typically be paying for uh, a kilowatt hour of oil fire generation are these all uh, going to be contracted out uh you know, to contract as developers, or are some of them going to be handled by in-house, so to speak, by Hawaiian Electric? All of the generation, all of the solar facilities are going to be uh, independent power producers. And the big uh, standalone storage here on Oahu will be a standalone, uh, will be a, an independent power producer. The two projects that Hawaiian Electric is building, one is on Maui, one is on Hawaii Island. And those are our company's bill. They, they were chosen through competitive bidding, but our company was able to bid into the process. And we're very careful to make sure that the, the bidding team is not part of any other information flow. So they were, they're fully competitive with everybody else that was trying to do that. You know, you know, Peter, you mentioned in the course that uh, this is going to take two or three years before it all gets online. And right. uh, that, that is actually a perfect time frame because uh, I don't want to tell you anything you don't know, but we're in the middle of COVID right now. Uh, and COVID has a way of gumming everything up. Yeah. Um, so, you, you know, you go through the approval process, you organize these projects, developers organize these projects. They, building doesn't take that long once you get them organized. Uh, and then two or three years from now, presumably, I, I assume this is in the analysis, presumably we're beyond COVID. Uh, that's uh, beyond COVID, BC, beyond COVID. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right it works for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I, obviously that does throw a, a potential monkey wrench into the, into the works. But, uh, you know, there's, there are many things that can, can cause delays, including, uh, you know, insufficient panels and this and that and so forth. Any big, uh, any big construction project has inherent risks, uh, you know, so we are, that's kind of built into the system and we hope that uh, the COVID pandemic will disappear as a risk factor sooner rather than later. <laughs> You and seven billion others, okay? Exactly. Good, <laughs> good company to be in, I think. <laughs> Those um, are all the questions I have, Peter. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for the, yeah, Mitch, what, what's up? I just uh, wanted to know what, what kind of job creation or ma maintenance, uh, you know, keeping existing jobs, what's the, what's the kind of employment picture on this? I don't have hard numbers on that, but obviously it's a big construction, 300 megawatts of, of, of solar is a big construction project, you know, parceled out among the, the seven or eight companies. Uh, the, the building the, the batteries, the battery energy systems are, is also a big thing. After they're built, they tend not to take a lot of maintenance, as you know. So it's not a long-term thing. But in terms of the next year or two, again, one of the things that's important to us is to try to help um, restore the economy here and get us going again. And these projects will definitely contribute to that. Well, that's great. So I just want to get one final plug in. So thank you so much for keeping the lights on, keeping my oh, computer still going after all these months of working at home. So it's really great that you guys are- uh, We do it all for you, Mitch. 
What's that? <laughs> you're, you're, you're the only customer we've got, so we do it all for you. You know, amen to that, Peter. I, I get up in the morning. I mean, I swear to you, this is true. I get up in the morning every day. I turn the switch on and the lights go on and I say, okay, all right, Hawaiian Electric, okay. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, guys. Have a nice rest of your uh, conversation here. I'll be, I'll be listening in to, to hear about it, but I'll, I'll disappear now and uh, leave it to you guys to talk about the... Uh, you know, the fuel cell electric bus, which I'm interested in too. Take care. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Thank Peter. Aloha. So I'm okay, really now, Mitch. Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'll reintroduce uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Scott Higgins, who is uh, the driving force behind this fantastic project that we've, we, we've been doing for the last, how many years? Like six years or so. It's taken us a long time, both from the point of view of developing the technology, uh, going through all the testing, and then ultimately we decided to try to patent this thing. And I think it what, took us about at least two years, maybe three years to go through the patenting process, which is not a simple thing. And this is like a, a pretty uh, sophisticated piece of technology, but uh, we eventually, we just got the patent, what about two months ago now, maybe three months ago. And uh, of course we, uh, we, it's through the University of Hawaii uh, and so we want to be able to license this out to uh, people who need this. So I've, uh, you know, we've called this, uh, the title for this project is a fuel cell electric bus face mask. And uh, so you may be wondering, why did we call this technology a face mask? Well, I'll steal a little bit of thunder from you, Scott. I mean, the fuel cell is an air breather. So that's where it gets its oxygen from. So it's breathing in all this air, just like we do. And uh, there's lots of contamination in the air, not necessarily COVID, but all sorts of bad stuff. So I'm gonna turn that over to Scott, who is the brains behind all of this. All the technology you see was all Scott's doing. He did a great job. So Scott, tell us about, first of all, just tell us what sort of horrible things there are in the atmosphere for fuel cells. Oh, that's a good question, Mitch. Um, essentially, like you said, a fuel cell is an air breather. It takes air to run at most fuel cells. And we get that air from the atmosphere. And the only thing that we want in that air is air. And anything extra will impede the practicality and use of the fuel cell. So if we have contaminants in the air, those contaminants will make their way into the fuel cell. And if they do, they'll reduce its performance. And so what we've essentially got is the potential for poisoning of the fuel cell. What's a contaminant, Scott? What is it? It's essentially anything other than oxygen. And so obviously there's nitrogen in air as well, but that's inert. So that just passes right through and it, it doesn't react or have any negative impacts on the fuel cell. But once we start getting other, other air particles in there, like SO2 or NO2 or nitric oxide, or essentially anything in the atmosphere that's not oxygen or nitrogen, those are potential contaminants. And some of them are worse than others, like SO2 will make its way into the fuel cell and it will chemically adhere to the catalyst on the surface of the fuel cell. And when it does that, it will block, physically block that active reaction site from reacting. And so each molecule get, that gets absorbed onto the surface of the catalyst is reducing the effectiveness of that fuel cell by some small percentage. And that's, that's that permanent damage to the fuel cell? That's a good question. So, the, so there's ongoing research in that area and some contaminants will adsorb and they will desorb quickly depending on what's going on. Some of them will covalently bond to the surface. And when that happens, it is there forever. And there are some techniques that people are looking at in order to clean up those surfaces, but it's essentially blocked forever. So well, we've we've had we've had sensors around for a long time uh, to you know sense uh, sulfur and you know other other contaminants like that, um, and I, I know the university has worked with that in other contexts. I know, um, but uh, what took you so long? 
Look well, we were really <laughs> my boss. What's taking so long, Mitch? <laughs> well, we we're really serving a, a need. So as engineers, we fix problems. And the problem that came to us was the problem of running a fuel cell bus in Havo, the national park on the Big Island. And the goal was to run this fuel cell bus on this, on this island that was erupting SO2 into the atmosphere. And if we just took a fuel cell vehicle and put it in the park and we ran it around there, what it would happen is it would suck the SO2 in with the air in order to function. And that SO2 would covalently bond to the catalyst surface and it would essentially be dead in the water in no time. And so what we came up with was a device that is essentially turns a fuel cell vehicle into a smart vehicle that understands its environment and can react to it. And so it was really just solving a problem that popped up is why we came up with it now. Well, how do I screen SO2 out? How do I, do I have a filter of some kind or, or do I change the way the fuel cell operates in general? Both, the answer is both. So when you have high concentrations of SO2, we do have air filters that can filter out the SO2, but it's very difficult to balance how much air makes its way through the filter and the concentration of SO2 that gets absorbed. So if you push air with SO2 through a filter very quickly, a lot of the SO2 will not get bound up by the filter and it will just make its way through. And a fuel cell, like the ones that we operate in the parks require 2200 liters per minute of air. So it's a huge amount of air that needs to go through there. And if we try and just clean up the SO2, it will, some of, it, some of the SO2 will blow right through the filter getting into the fuel cell. And then also that filter will be getting accumulation of the contaminants. And once it's completely full of contaminants, the SO2 will just go right through. So part of the technology is understanding the capacity of the filter and having a real-time alarm that will show you how full that filter is so that you can change it out at exactly the right time. So one, one last question um, before I stop interrupting Mitch. Uh, That's okay. No, you're doing great. You know, okay, you have a patent and the university helped you get the patent. It's to their credit, um, the Office of Technology Transfer and all that. Um, but uh, I, guess, I guess the question I have is what is the art here? What are you protecting? What is the patent that makes it different from, you know, other patents? Well, it's a good question. So the art here is in the details of protecting the fuel cell. So what we're doing is creating this sensor system that, like I said, understands the capacity of the filter. It also understands the external environment that, that the fuel is getting pulled from. And it's taking both of those inputs of data and it's running them to the control system on the bus so that in a scenario that the filter can handle, the filter is used. In a scenario that the filter can't handle, the battery is used, that's the backup battery on the bus. And so it's really the integration and the control systems that is the IP. Got it. So the software and a control system driven by the software and fed by the sensors. Yeah, yes, exactly. And it's a, it's a smart system. In other words, as you said, the driver has a constant display showing how well this filter is working, like Scott said. And then when it reaches a certain level, it's like the yellow light comes on or he's like, uh oh, you know, it's starting to clog up. And then there are a lot of things he can do. You know, I can, it, it, the, the system, if it gets too bad, will automatically stop the fuel cell, like, like Scott said, and then you ride through this cloud of, of uh, pollution on your battery or get, be able to get back to base so you're not like dead in the water. Um, but if, if you still have some time, uh, you can ride through it and then continue on your mission. Uh, and the other thing is we, we've also allowed 
to be able to uh, you know have two air filters. One one is you're being use you're using it, and then the other one's a hot spare, and the system will automatically switch over to the uh, the fresh filter uh, that's uh, um, available. And so that that allows you to complete your mission, i.e., transport people through the park in this case. Um, or if you're running a bus company, you know your your buses aren't falling out of the sky because uh, the fuel cell is clogging up. For example, mm. like a place like Beijing or in some places in India, where you can hardly see your hand in front of your face that the pollution is so bad. Or, or so, Seattle. Or, yeah, or, or Seattle. California. Or now with all the, you know, with all the forest fires in California, <laughs> this is like a new app for us. You know, we can apply this <laughs> so, you know, like your fire trucks, for example, your fire truck goes into one of these areas. It's sucking all this bad stuff into the, uh, in this case, into their engines, but in, it could be a fuel cell power tr uh, fire truck at some point in the future. So, so does this require yeah, so, some so, kind of special installation? I mean, do I have to get down there and, you know, with a crew for three days or a week and install it special, or is it just a little box that I, uh, I connect to a few things and bingo, it works? So fuel cell vehicles right now are running blind, which means that they're sucking air out of the environment and they have no idea what's in the air and they have no idea if they're filter is actually effectively pulling contaminants out of the atmosphere. So our, our concept here is to protect fuel cells. And like Mitch can tell you, fuel cells are very expensive. So once you invest in one, you want to make sure the longevity of that fuel cell isn't short. And so in the areas that you're talking about, this is where our application will work best. And so in order to install it, we're gonna to have to work with the companies and the fuel cell vehicles to bring the technology in, but it's, it's possible to integrate into both vehicles that are run by fuel cells and stationary fuel cells. Any idea of the cost for a given vehicle? It's a good uh, question. I'm gonna give it to the CEO here. <laughs> uh, well, this was a prototype. Uh, uh, development. So the bottom line is, no, we don't have a cost for that yet. Um, I mean, going forward, there's things we want to do with it. Uh, for example, we want to miniaturize it more and make it like a product, like you just said. Um, and uh, so we've been working with one major company on a parallel project, but but they have that, that experience uh, got us together with them. We have this relationship with this huge company that makes uh, these sensors. So yeah, we don't have it yet. Um, but these are fitted on two of the uh, volcano buses that were gifted to the, the uh, County of Hawaii uh, Mass Transit Agency. So we're actually going to be ac having them out deployed and th they're totally fitted out with data acquisition. So we'll be able to track, you know, how well they work and, uh, you know, what breaks, what, what doesn't break and, and look for areas where we can reduce costs. So um, it's still very much in that kind of a phase, so it's not a pro it's not an off-the-shelf product yet. Mm. Strikes me that uh, you know, of course, um, the initial purpose here in, in a volcano, you, you have serious contaminants, but there'll always be some contaminants, and there'll always be some benefits. So, if I were a an hydrogen bus manufacturer, or if I you know created the what do you call it the fuel cell part of a yeah. hydrogen bus. I would say, well, I can, I can sell more. I can have a longer life, you know, more sustainable, uh, more efficient. If I, if I build this kind of device right into my bus with every hydrogen bus, with every fuel cell hydrogen bus, uh, I would put this, this box in there and I would connect it up and nobody would have to come afterward and, you know, and, and connect it for me. It would be there. It would be standard operating equipment. What do you think about that? Fuel cell companies warranty their fuel cells. So when a fuel cell goes down and goes bad, it costs manufacturers a lot of money. And so I think you're hitting the nail on the head with that in that a fuel cell manufacturer wants to protect their own product for as long as possible, at least through the warranty period. And this is one way to do it. Yeah, it's like, it's like when you, um, you, you buy certain equipment um, here, your home, your home. 
Um, so you put uh, fire detection systems in your in your home. All of a sudden, your premium goes down. Okay, so the cost of that warranty would go down. Or putting it another way, it's more profitable for the person selling the warranty. Now, so if I were selling warranties about this, I would insist on having this because that would make the risk under the warranty less and potentially very much less. Well, exactly. So for example, right now, um, fuel cells uh, have been documented uh, being able to operate. For, they have over 30,000 hours on a fuel cell. Now, how much longer could that fuel cell last if we had our device in there? I mean, could it, could it double its lifetime? I say 60 you know, or 70,000 hours. And then that, that's a significant cost savings, but, but both from, like you said, from the, from the uh, point of view of uh, operations and maintenance. And you got to look at the guy that's running the bus fleet, the guys that operate, you know, the, the maintainers. I mean, it, it gives that guy confidence to buy the system because he knows he can manage his risk. And uh, I mean, this, this system can be monitored externally too. Like, okay, the bus driver has his like little heads up display, but the bus operator itself, each bus in his fleet could feed in a signal telling them what's the status of my air filters right now. And so they can help manage it. So if you get some operators a little bit, you know, half asleep at the switch and is not paying attention, back home at home base, they can, uh, they, they, they know exactly what the status of the health of their air filtration systems are and air is a big deal. You know, one thing strikes me is that, um, you know, we live in a, uh, as, as discussed with Peter Ross, we live in the time of COVID right. and regrettably uh, manufacturing becomes an issue, especially when you had hopes of manufacturing in China, for example. Uh, if I took the device that you have patented and you, you know, designed and everything, and I went to China or some other country, maybe in, uh, in Asia, and I had it manufactured there, um, Korea comes to mind. Yeah? Um, the uh, cost of manufacturing, it would be substantially less. So uh, I know you haven't started manufacturing yet, but when you do start manufacturing, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be better to go outside the United States for manufacturing? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh you know, um, we're very capable of doing volume manufacturing, you know, the use of robotics, you know, uh, for manufacturing things. And uh, really, um, you know, the, uh, the blush is off the rose now for manufacturing in these kinds of countries because they try to rip you off. So we don't want to give them the technology. We want to keep it here in the good old US of A and jobs for Americans. And yeah, we're happy to export it to them. And we'll even export them the whole bus, you know. But yeah, no, I, I think, at least from my point of view, we want to keep the manufacturing. Well, that, well, that raises the question of, um, you know, where are these buses manufactured now? I guess there are a lot of them are custom, but uh, where would they be manufactured in volume later? Would that be also in the U.S.? Well, uh, yes, in, in many ways they would be because we have a Buy American Act, uh, particularly for the buses uh, who are, uh, you know, all these transit agencies get federal funding. And uh, if they don't have a very high content of American made um, goods or, or, or percentages in their vehicle, they, they can't, they're not eligible for that funding. So there's, there's a lot of leverage, le levers available to, you know, force the manufacturing to remain here in the US. So well, what are the uh, what are the, the steps? Well, ultimately, hang on, but ultimately we're licensing this technology. So there's a limit to what we can control where it's going to be manufactured. To whom? We well, that's that's uh, that's where we're at. We're, at, we're, at, we're at that phase now. That now that we have the actual patent and that we've got the systems on actual buses, now's the time to go out and uh, quote market slash sell, you know, licenses to this technology, and of course. The university is very, uh, very interested in this. They invested quite a lot of money in, in uh, just getting the patent, and we want to honor their investment. Also, but it raises the whole time frame thing. I mean, again, COVID gets in the way to some extent, but well, you know, what's, what's the plan on the time frame? What, what are the, um, the steps along the way? Um, and, and let's assume, and I would like to assume this, that hydrogen buses will be really popular. 
in various contexts, various uses, purposes, and sure. you know, situations, configurations, and the like. Um, when would this be ready for market? When would it be uh, an item on the shelf, so to speak? Uh, two years, three years, five years? Uh, um, how do you see that evolving? I think we could evolve fairly quickly. I would say, say one to two years. Um, we could uh, have it as a product. We've already worked with one company who's very familiar with this uh, technology. So we're going to start with them and then we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, but what, you know, what exactly will Scott do? Well, He's, uh, his, his work is finished, isn't it? Scott, this is when you retire, is that what happens? Uh, the work is never finished. So we have, uh, we have the first generation prototype built and working. And so that's a proof of concept. And now we have ideas to add functionality to it, reduce its size, reduce its cost. There's a lot of little engineering that's gonna go into this thing and continue improving it. Do you think you'll get more patents on it? We haven't talked about that, but it's a possibility. Yeah, well, it's very nice that uh, the Officer of Technology Transfer helped you, but query, can they keep on helping you? You know, maybe you have to make some money first. <laughs> well, you know, they, when they uh, see that this is a viable product, then, you know, once people see viability in it, then all of a sudden they, they want to invest, you know, call it investing in it. So yeah, it'll- uh... It's also good to keep in mind the size of the industry. It's a $10 billion industry in fuel cells per year, and it's projected to grow exponentially due to clean air acts and, and the movement towards there. So I think uh, protecting those fuel cells is important to ensure the longevity of all the fuel cells that they sell. And so getting involved in protecting them, I think is a good position for UH and HNEI to be in. Sure. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me, uh, I meant to ask you about it earlier is, uh, so right now it's a bus and it's hydrogen bus and it's, it's got a lot of space for devices like this and you're gonna try to make it smaller and all that. What about the Miura? Um, is that the right pronunciation? You know, the, the, the hydrogen car. Hmm? Yeah, the Mariah. Yeah. Mariah. Yeah, so what, what, what about that? What about other hydrogen devices? that are you know, being planned and developed and they will come into the marketplace. Is this something that would apply to every single fuel cell device? Arguably it could, no? Exactly, that's the idea. Most of the manufacturers have a fuel cell prototype and they're moving it into the line. And all of those fuel cell vehicles, uh, this could be applied to in terms of protection. Also, the stationary market is a huge one. There's a lot of places that use fuel cells as primary energy devices or backup energy devices. And each one of those cases, especially in the case of backup supply of energy for hospitals, I think is important to protect that. Oh, yeah. yeah. In fact, that's something we looked at uh, from the you know, coronavirus kind of uh, thing, as, as, as uh, Scott said, is applying this uh, kind of concept to other, other uses such as that. Well, beyond, you know, beyond the uh, generation of electricity using fuel cells, um, I mean, in a car, in a vehicle, right. it's, it seems to me, uh, you know, you raised this whole thing about backup systems for hospitals, for example. Are we going somewhere in, in that direction too? Uh, are fuel cells going to go beyond vehicles here? Are they efficient and useful, flexible enough to be used for backup systems in my house or uh, in you know other contexts? Is that where we're going with with hydrogen and fuel cells, and for that matter, your device? Yeah, in fact, people are looking at your you know fuel cell powered cars as your backup system for your house, just like you said. You you have this uh, basically power production plant which produces electricity and you can plug your house into it and uh, power your house. Like I, I have uh, my buses on the big island have uh, power export units so that each of the buses becomes a mobile emergency power plant during a time of emergency. If your grid goes down, for example, you know, that means all your, uh, you, you know, all your communications, everything else is at risk. And so all of a sudden your, your fleet of buses becomes this mobile, uh, um, fleet of, of power sources. And so when people start saying, well, gee, you know, a fuel cell bus is so much more expensive than a diesel bus. 
uh, actually the parity is coming down quickly, but you know, what's the value proposition? What's the value of being able to use your bus to power critical loads when we get slammed by a hurricane and, and the whole grid goes down like it has, or we have a big earthquake, whatever the disaster is. So civil defense loves this idea. And it's all about this uh, resiliency we've been talking about for years and years. Well, that's how you justify uh, putting in these fleets of buses. People say, and then, you know, this thing will go for 30 hours at, at, at providing backup power. People say, well, what happens when you run out of hydrogen? Well, I go back to my hydrogen station, I have to refill. Well, where are you gonna get the power for the, to run the hydrogen station? Well, I'm gonna get it off my bus because I just plug the fueling station into my bus, I power it up, I refuel in six minutes, and I'm back on, back on the road going out there to provide emergency power. Well, it strikes me that if I was a, you know, a survivalist, and I may need to be a survivalist with the storms that are coming, uh, and God knows what else with climate change, um, I would like to have a tank of hydrogen in the back, and I'd like to have one of these you know, fuel cell units generating power from my house, and when the tank runs out, I want to have a second tank and, and so forth. And uh, I like to use this as a backup system. It sounds like this has benefits that other backup systems uh, may not have. Uh, how would you compare it with putting a lot of solar on the roof? Well, I mean, solar on the roof. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You go, Scott. I've been hogging the conversation. Oh, that's okay, Mitch. All good stuff. But I was just going to say, uh, you know, you being a survival survivalist, it kind of, like if you take a step back, the country needs to be a survivalist because we are burning fossil fuels at a very rapid rate. And if someday those fossil fuels are gonna run out. And when it does, we're either gonna be left holding the bag or we're gonna have these other technologies developed. One of which is fuel cell technology. And so I think from your own personal perspective, it makes sense to have a fuel cell backup in your home but also from a strategic perspective on the national and world scale, it makes, it makes sense to have these technologies developed, especially fuel cells. What was your question again? Uh, what, what, how, compare that with solar on my roof. What, what's a better solution for me? And it's well, the solution me, the solar is- Solar on my roof is only good during the day. I've, I've got to have a battery system of some kind. Uh, so it may be uh, better to have these tanks of hydrogen in the back. Well, the solution could be both. So you could potentially use the solar energy that you produce during the day to electrolyze water and produce hydrogen and store it as a fuel for when you need it at night or in an emergency situation. Hmm. Strikes me that you shouldn't retire just yet, Scott. Uh, you, you, <laughs> you've, got, you've got miles to go and all kinds of other you know, science to develop and devices to create before you're done. As a matter of fact, I would say, actually, you're only beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jay. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Can we go to the last slide of our seven slide deck that we haven't seen? <laughs> so I just want to throw this one up to, to show uh, this is how we can, you know, if the, for our audience, anybody who's interested in this technology wants to know more, there's a splash of our actual patent. So, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, speaking with forked tongues and also uh, Ann Park is the uh, lady in the uh, Office of Technology Transfer and she's been great uh, supporting us for all these years. So uh, hats off to them. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the investment made by the Office of Naval Research, HNEI, and the uh, State of Hawaii and the Barrel Tax Fund. So I think I haven't covered everybody, but some of the main players, you know, we've covered off here. So with that, Following my mentor's advice on how to close a program, I want to say aloha. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, coming on board and telling us about this uh, invention. And, and My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. And thank you, my mentor, Jay, for helping out on this show. So with that, it's aloha from Hawaii, the state of clean energy.